Good afternoon. My name is Ryan Kennedy. I'm faculty with the Institute for Global Tobacco Control and the Department of Health, Behavior, and Society. And I have the honor of welcoming all of you today to our Innovations Lecture Series. I'm very excited. In fact, I'm thrilled to uh, introduce our speaker today, Marissa Rietzma, who is going to be delivering an, our Innovations Lecture entitled, Quantifying the Global Health Impacts of Smoking. So all of us in the room today and those watching online are likely aware of the tremendous burden that tobacco use, in particular smoking, has on public health. The WHO reports that tobacco kills more than 8 million people each year, more than 7 million from using tobacco, and over 1 million from the result of exposure to secondhand smoke. The effort necessary to arrive at this num number, 8 million deaths, to me is overwhelming. Where to start? Smoking can cause cancer. It can cause cancer in almost every part of your body, your bladder, your colon, your esophagus, your kidneys. It can cause cancer in your stomach, trachea, and of course your lungs. And that's just cancer. And that's just some of the parts of your body. There's also heart disease, pulmonary disease, type 2 diabetes. Quantifying the global health impacts of smoking means quantifying those impacts and then doing it for every corner of the world. And then forecasting into the future. And then there's the work to estimate what the numbers could be under different tobacco control policy scenarios. The abil ability for us at the Institute for Global Tobacco Control to tell governments and civil society groups the number of lives that could be saved from implementing an important tobacco control policy is remarkably powerful. And that is the work that Marissa Rietzman and her colleagues Ritzma and her colleagues at the Institute for Health Metrics, IHMC, at the University of Washington in beautiful Seattle. That's the work that she undertakes. And that's what she's going to be describing for us today. For several years now, my colleague Kevin Walding and I have had the opportunity to participate on an advisory group for IHME and help the team that's working on the global burden of disease, the GBD, working to better quantify smoking's impact. At those meetings, Kevin and I have had the opportunity to see Ms. Ritzma in action. We've met, witnessed her share her incredible knowledge, her incredible working knowledge of tobacco control surveys. Some people have the ability to quote poems, other parts of literature. I watched Marissa quote survey questions and response options from dozens of different surveys, just like that. Marissa grew up in Massachusetts and completed a degree in biology from Brown University, graduating in 2014. With this training, she moved west and for the last five years has been working at IHME, two years as a post-bachelor fellow, which everyone should ask her about because it sounds like an amazing program there, and three years as a researcher. Her main focus was on tobacco burden estimation as part of the GBD study. But she's also um, done other things, including um, trying to figure out primary data collection to improve tobacco surveillance in resource-constrained settings, and in her spare time, also models obesity, alcohol use, and drug use. She recently started a PhD in health policy at Stanford University and is a prestigious Knight Hennessy Scholar. She continues, because she has so much spare time doing a full-time PhD, she continues to work part-time for IHME, and I can't imagine what they would do without her. Um, an interesting fact is that Marissa played rugby in college, so don't mess with her. <laughs> Looking forward to your talk, and welcome. Uh, thank you so much, Ryan, and thank you all for being here. Um, it's really a great honor for me um, and grateful for this invitation. Um, before I start, I've planned for about 40, 45 minutes of content, um, but I want to make sure that everyone is sort of staying up to speed with what I'm saying, especially as we dig into some of the methods. Um, so if at any point you're unsure of what I'm doing or what I'm talking about, feel free to just raise your hand and ask a question. I don't mind um, being interrupted, and I'd rather everyone is following what I'm saying. Um, if something's you know, going to be covered later, of course, I'll defer it to later on in the presentation. 
Uh, Ryan's, you know, great introduction um, has left us with this uh, first page of the 2017 WHO report um, on the global tobacco epidemic, which said that tobacco use kills more than 7 million people each year. So by show of hands, how many of you have heard this statistic before? Just before, not Ryan saying it, but outside of that context, how many of you have seen this number? Okay, most people. Now, uh, raise your hand if you know how that number was produced, at least some of the high-level methods. You've heard me talk at least once before. Okay, one person, a few people here. So my goal uh, today is to give you all some exposure to the methods that we're using to come up with this estimate. So we understand the strengths and limitations, can be able to interpret what we're putting out into the world, and hopefully use it for improving tobacco control policy globally. Quick background on the Global Burden of Disease study. So the GBD is the great entity that produces this statistic that's used um, saying that tobacco use kills more than 7 million people each year. And the idea of the GBD is that it's a systematic and scientific effort to quantify the comparative magnitude of health loss due to diseases, injuries, and in our case, risk factors. Each of these estimates are produced by five-year age group, sex, and um, for 195 different countries and territories. And we have more than 800 different subnational locations that we're looking at as well. It's a really great undertaking. There is more than 300 people working in Seattle on this project and more than 4,000 global collaborators. And we have a team of around 10 um, that are working on tobacco specifically at IHME. We produce annual updates and you can actually access all of the results, all of the data and all of the code online. So a quick history of smoking burden estimation. Uh, back in 1953, the idea of attributable risk was first developed in the context of smoking um, by Morton Levin, and he proposed this idea of a population attributable fraction. And that led to a proliferation of mainly country-specific estimates of smoking attributable burden that were based on prevalence and relative risk. Now, the challenges with this approach to estimating smoking burden are that for many parts of the world, particularly back in the 80s and 90s, um, the availability of prevalence data or specific exposure data was quite limited. So maybe we have good data in the United States, but how are we going to produce estimates in a place like Kenya? Another challenge, and this is a challenge that is really ongoing today, is the generalizability of the relative risks that we have. So relative risks are mainly coming from cohort studies and case control studies, and these are often conducted in high income settings. And the big problem with this is that we're saying, OK, the relative risk of a current smoker for lung cancer is maybe 22. But that is assuming all of the embedded smoking history and the patterns of use among the smokers in that cohort study. And that's not necessarily generalizable to other parts of the world where smoking patterns are much different. People might be smoking fewer cigarettes or there might be more occasional smokers. So that led to 1992 when the Pedo Lopez method was first published. Um, it's also called the smoking impact ratio method. And this approach was developed in order to produce global burden estimates in the absence of a good prevalence data and in the absence of generalizable relative risks. The Pedo Lopez method uses lung cancer mortality as a proxy for the intensity of the smoking epidemic. And it basically converts populations into equivalents of people in this cancer prevention study number two, um, from which we can apply the relative risk. So we're basically looking at lung cancer mortality, comparing observed versus expected, which is the never smoker lung cancer mortality. And that difference gives us an idea of the intensity of the epidemic, and then we can use it to produce um, smoking burden estimates for all countries in the world where we have lung cancer data. Now, the problem is that the accuracy of lung cancer mortality estimates is, uh, is really tricky to get at. So a lot of the countries in the world, um, we don't, uh, particularly in Africa, for example, some countries in Southeast Asia, we don't have good data on lung cancer mortality. So we end up in this really odd circle of we're using smoking to predict lung cancer and lung cancer to predict smoking. 
And that is both problematic in and of itself, but it also prevents us from doing a lot of the cool estimation uh, questions that we care about. So predicting things into the future, because if we're using lung cancer as a proxy, we aren't going to get the effects of policies on lung cancer. We're getting the effects of policies on prevalence. And so over the course of um, the past two years, and then just recently published as part of the Global Burden of Disease 2017 study, we developed an entirely new set of methods to estimate smoking attributable burden that gets around these limitations that I've described. So the, the, the changing data, so GATS, GYTS, all of the investment in generating survey data on tobacco use and exposure have allowed us to much better quantify smoking histories. And also, we're just in a new technological landscape where we have supercomputers that can allow us to do lots of complicated simulation studies that just weren't possible back in the 1990s when these method methods were first developed. So we um, have developed an approach that uses dose response risk curves that incorporates both current and former smokers and allows us to produce direct estimates for all health outcomes. So we're no longer relying on the smoking impact indirect method um, for burden estimation. So the content of the talk, I have sort of a section on methods and a section on results. And I could honestly talk for hours about both of those. And so I would love to just get a show of hands um, in terms of who is more interested in like a deeper dive on the methods compared to results. And then who is more interested in the results compared to the methods? OK, so it, we're leaning a little bit heavier towards the methods. Um, I had guessed that some people would be unhappy either way. That's what happens with compromises. Um, so I'll focus mainly on the methods, um, then talk a little bit about results. And you know, I'm always happy to chat over email, Skype, et cetera. My information will be at the end of the presentation. So the Global Burden of Disease study uses the comparative risk assessment framework. And that is an approach to do counterfactual risk attribution, where we're comparing the observed state of risk exposure in the world to the ideal state, where for the case of smoking, everyone is at the theoretical minimum risk exposure level. And that is that nobody has and never has smoked. Um, the theoretical minimum risk exposure level is a little bit more complicated for other risk factors is mainly metabolic risk factors, where you wouldn't want a BMI of zero, right? That is, you know, very, very bad. Um, but for smoking, it's really quite simple. And that's the simplest part of the CRA framework for us. Now, blocking out um, the methods that we're using into these categories for exposure, we create estimates of smoking prevalence, both current smoking prevalence and former smoking prevalence. And then among these people that are exposed, we estimate individual level distributions of exposure. So we estimate the distribution of cigarettes smoked per day in a population, distribution of pack years, so cumulative exposure, and then a distribution among former smokers of years since quitting. We pair those with dose response relative risks. And this allows us to get around this generalizability problem because we can create a full risk curve for something like cigarettes per day and ischemic heart disease. And maybe people in Mexico that are smoking fewer cigarettes per day, we can still place them onto that risk curve, even if we don't have um, good cohort studies coming out of some countries. And among former smokers, this is where it gets a little tricky, and I'll delve into it a bit more in the future. Um, but we have risk reduction curves among former smokers. So we're saying, what is your relative risk of a former smoker compared to a never smoker as a function of years since quitting? So we still have excess risk, but that excess risk decreases with time until you get to the point where the excess risk is, is the same as, um, as a never smoker, so a relative risk of one. And as I mentioned, the theoretical minimum risk exposure level is pretty simple. It's just that the entire population has never smoked. Any questions up until this point? Good. So I'm going to walk you through the steps that we take to reconstruct individuals' smoking histories. Now, this is really important because we know that just having a dichotomous or categorical indicator of relative risks among current smokers, former smokers, that's insufficient to capture the really important predictors of health outcomes. 
So the most important, I've had this conversation with a few of you this morning, we spend about 80% of our effort working on data and all of the fun modeling and coding, that is maybe 20% of the time. And so the first task for us is to comprehensively extract um, the world's smoking data. And this is coming from surveys, cross-sectional studies um, that have been conducted in most countries in the world. So of course we have really high coverage of the simplest indicator of current smoking. We have almost all of the 195 countries that we estimate for. There's just four that are outstanding. Um, and we have really great country coverage in terms of the time series. We have multiple data points um, covering even a single year. And we have you know, really excellent information to produce a comprehensive time series for every location, year, age, and sex. Now, as we go down this list, you'll see that the data coverage starts to diminish. And this is where we start relying more on models as opposed to the data. And we're lucky because some of these indicators, such as the age of initiation, we find is somewhat constant over time. And so the modeling tasks that we have to undertake for this initiation rates change a lot, but the age at which people start smoking we find is really quite consistent. And so there are some regional patterns where we can leverage data in neighboring countries, um, and we observe time series in some parts of the world, but that time series is pretty flat. So we can come up with a pretty good estimate of age of initiation, even when we only have 44% of countries covered. Just to give you a sense of the distribution of survey data that covers just the indicator of current smoking, um, you can see in most high income countries, we have almost um, 40 or more sources, but still in Africa, North Africa, the Middle East, um, it's relatively data sparse. And so those are the areas where our estimates will improve a lot as more survey data are collected. Now the next step that we take is we, once we have acquired all of this survey data, we now need to adjust it to make it comparable. So we want to be comparing apples to apples, not apples to oranges. And in the context of smoking, we have our specific case definitions for each of the indicators that I've mentioned. And the problem is that surveys often don't ask about the smoking behaviors in ways that perfectly match to our gold standard case definitions. So for example, they might ask, do you smoke daily? But we don't ask, but they don't ask, do you currently smoke? And that might be, maybe you smoke only on weekends or maybe you smoke every other day. And so it would be an underestimate if we were just to take the daily smoking prevalence indicator and put it into our models. And that can create a lot of compositional bias issues, time trends. Um, so we need to do an adjustment, which you'll see here is just a simple linear regression where we take all of the data that we have and within a survey, sometimes, the survey will ask about smoking in different ways. So GATS is a great example of this, where they ask about smoking in so many different ways, we can generate more than 20 different indicators. And then within that single survey, so we don't have non-sampling issues, we can create um, pairwise comparisons that allow us to fit this regression and then come up with an adjustment factor to transform the non-standard case definitions into our gold standard. And we fit these regressions specific to sex, specific to region, by age. And this is really important because in some parts of the world, we have very different smoking patterns. So in the US, um, the daily smoking adjustment factor might be about 1.3. And what this means is that to go from an indicator that asks just about daily smoking prevalence to an indicator of current smoking prevalence, we need to multiply it by 1.3. Now, as some of you know that are working in other parts of the world, this is not necessarily a generalizable adjustment. If you look in a place like Mexico, we have a much higher proportion of occasional smokers. And so if we were to apply the US adjustment to Mexico, we would end up with a significant underestimate of current smoking prevalence. We do a similar adjustment for non-standard age and sex groups. 
And so what we do is we take all of the data that we have in age and sex specific, and we produce a model of smoking prevalence in order to generate an age sex pattern that we can then apply to aggregate age groups. So a survey that records data for smoking prevalence ages 15 to 64, we need to split that out into five-year age groups. And it's really important to have location-specific age patterns, once again, because this varies quite significantly by geography. Where in the United States, for example, we have an increase in prevalence and then a decrease in prevalence as people get older. But in Southeast Asia and Africa, we see the age pattern is very different. We have pretty much increases across age for smoking prevalence. And so if we were to split India data using the age pattern from the United States, we would end up with entirely wrong prevalence estimates. So the next step is modeling a complete time series. So we leverage the patterns that we observe in data both across space, across time, and across age group to make a comprehensive internally internally consistent set of estimates that also incorporate uncertainty. We use a three-stage modeling process. Um, at IHME, we call it spatio-temporal Gaussian process regression, which is quite a mouthful. But you can see the final estimates that we're producing are the ones in green with the shaded uncertainty behind. And those are pretty good proxy of the, the data that you're observing. Whereas our first stage, the red model, and the second stage, the blue model, are getting closer but are not quite there yet. Um, I'm not gonna get too much into the details of a spatio-temporal Gaussian process regression, but this is something that we can definitely chat about um, over email, over Skype if you're interested. Um, but the idea is just that we're able to leverage patterns that are observed in neighboring regions, across age groups, across time periods, to produce a really nice set of prevalence estimates. Are there, are there any questions up until this point? This is some of the hardest methods. Um, I'm happy to pause and, and take a question. Okay, I'll take that as I'm being extremely clear and keep on moving on. Um, so if you think about smoking prevalence what we uh, and how it predicts risk, what we care about is not necessarily your current smoking status, but it's your whole smoking history. And what we've developed is a birth cohort approach that allows us to have individuals accumulating risk across time in a way that is consistent with the smoking um, profile that was experienced by their birth cohort. And this is important because if you think about calculating pack years, most people will multiply how much someone is smoking by how long they've been smoking for. And the problem with that is you can see there's a very specific age pattern to cigarettes consumed per day. And the age groups where we care most about cancer burden prediction are the ones where the cigarettes per day starts tailing off at the end. And so if we were to calculate pack years just by multiplying what you're seeing here by how long people have been smoking for, we would end up with an underestimate of their cumulative risk. And that also doesn't even take into account the fact that the amount that people have smoked has changed across time. So people were smoking a lot more cigarettes per day 20, 30 years ago. And we want that to be reflected in the way that we're calculating pack years and we're having individuals accumulating risk in our model. So do we do a birth cohort reconstruction where we're leveraging um, supply side cigarettes per capita data, as well as the age sex pattern of consumption from surveys to follow birth cohorts across time and the pack years that you've seen that you'll see that we use are actually summing up across these individual colored lines. And so we're capturing the fact that people that were born in 1930, 1940, they were smoking up to two packs a day. Now the final piece in terms of reconstructing these smoking histories is we need to go from means to complete distributions. And what that means is we wanna take the average modeled effect and create a full individual level distribution of, in this case, the age at which people start smoking. 
And we overcomplicate it a bit by using an ensemble approach where we say that it's not the the single best performing distribution is not, for example, log logistic, but it's some weighted combination of a number of component distributions. But at a very high level, all we're doing is we're taking a mean, we predict a standard deviation for that mean, and then we use that to derive a full individual level distribution of exposure that we can then use in multiplying with the relative risk to produce population attributable fractions. So here's just a high level schematic of the indicators that we end up producing. We have cigarettes smoked per day. And the, and the um, thing to notice here is it's cigarette equivalents. So what we're modeling are all smoked tobacco products. And we transform um, non-cigarette products into equivalents of cigarettes. And this is something, sort of an area of improvement because we want the transformation to be based off of the health effects, the relative health effects of different products. Um, right now we're just doing a straight tobacco um, like weight um, conversion. And so that is definitely an area of improvement for the future. Um, we also use that to construct estimates of pack years and those are used to predict burden for, uh, for cancers and COPD. And then of course the years since quitting indicator um, for former smokers. So that's a whirlwind tour of exposure. Um, I'll be talking about relative risks next. Um, happy to pause and answer questions about exposure. Um, if you ask your question, I can repeat it. Yeah, so the, the question is, how do we deal with all of the new products and the multitude of products in producing these estimates of cigarette equivalents um, per day? Um, unfortunately, the answer is not satisfying. Um, the Pito Lopez, that indirect estimation approach, actually does this um, much better than we do because it's able to abstract um, product-specific health effects into this differential in terms of uh, lung cancer mortality. What we're doing right now is we map products into, at this phase, four different categories. Um, we have cigarettes, and unfortunately that has to include manufactured cigarettes, hand-rolled cigarettes, BDs. Um, we have uh, pipes and cigars, and then we have hookah. Um, and then we have sort of a, a catch-all other category. So there's lots of other country-specific um, uh, products that we, we don't have enough data right now to specifically estimate. And I, I'm sure the million-dollar question in the room is, what are we doing with e-cigarettes? Um, and right now, nothing. So um, e-cigarettes are not a part of the smoked tobacco estimates, and they're not a, a part of the global burden of disease study at this point. It's a direction that we'll move into in the future when more data are there. But we map these into four categories. And then we do a conversion based off of the, um, you know, the grams per day in each of those, thinking that that might be somewhat of a proxy um, for the health effects. But what's really missing are um, specific studies on the health impacts of these different products. So we need relative risks um, for hookah and lung cancer. And then we can do a health effect based conversion as opposed to a weight based conversion. Great. And we can have uh, definitely more questions at the end as you think of things. So relative risk, as I mentioned, the main limitation is the generalizability of the relative risk data that we have. Now, most relative risk studies, these cohort studies, case control studies are coming from high income countries where there's a very specific smoking pattern that not is not necessarily generalizable to all countries in the world. So same as exposure, the first step is, of course, comprehensively screening and extracting all the relevant data. So we conducted a huge systematic review in 2017 where across 36 different health outcomes, we ended up reviewing more than 20,000 published papers, and trust me, this was not all me. We have a big team at IHME that is helping to support this work. But we ended up extracting um, more than 550 
different papers, different studies that met our inclusion criteria with some uh, geographic generalizability because um, over time there have been more studies conducted in other countries. And that yielded more than 7,000 data points that went into modeling. The modeling strategy that we use is a dose response uh, Bayesian meta-regression. Um, where you can see the example for lung cancer here, there is actually a lot of heterogeneity in the studies um, that have been reporting the relative risks of smoking on lung cancer as a function of pack years. And this is a big change from what we were doing in previous iterations where we were only using the CPS2 relative risk. So now we're incorporating um, all of the global studies on the relative risks in a single um, risk equation, which then we apply based off of exposure estimated in a given location, year, age, and sex. And the dose response aspect is really important because it allows us to get uh, much more granular estimates of relative risk where we have good estimates of exposure and we can peg populations on this risk curve based off of all of the survey data that have been collected. So we don't need cohort studies when we have these dose response relative risks. And that's the case uh, for current smokers, but the problem with former smokers is it's actually a two-dimensional issue because the relative risk among former smokers depends both on the years since quitting, but also um, the smoking history of individuals before they quit. So if you smoke a pack a day for 30 years and you quit, 10 years out, you're gonna be at a higher relative risk than someone who smoked half a pack a day for 10 years. And so if we were to just try and straight out model all of the different data, the, all of the different cohort studies that have produced these relative risk estimates as a function of years since quitting, we'd end up with a substantial compositional bias. And we also wouldn't be able to apply those relative risks to populations that weren't represented. So we came up with um, what I think is a pretty nifty approach where still some limitations that I'll mention, but what we do is we model the rate of risk reduction. So we transform all of the different studies into a um, consistent uh, 10 to one um, risk reduction framework. We model that rate and then we're able to shift this curve up and down based off of the um, exposure weighted relative risk among current smokers for a given location, year, age, and sex. So I think this is probably the hardest part of the presentation to understand. But what I'm basically saying is that we don't want to be giving the former smoker relative risk um, to all countries in the world without adjusting for smoking history. And our current smoker relative risks that is a proxy of smoking history, because if you imagine that time equals zero in terms of years since quitting, the relative risk of a former smoker a day after they quit is, should be the same as the relative risk of a current smoker. Now, of course, there is a couple limitations. The first one is that people might have changed their smoking patterns. So we're saying that the smoking patterns of a former smoker might be different than the smoking patterns of a current smoker. And unfortunately, that's a limitation that we have not been able to overcome yet. The other limitation is that the rate of risk reduction might also be a function of smoking history. So we're saying not just the level is different, but the rate at which something declines should be different based off of theory. And that's another uh, sort of methodological area that we can go into, thinking about multi-dimensional risk surfaces. Um, but it's also a data limitation where we don't have a lot of data to characterize that risk surface. What this looks like in practice is that we're just applying different relative risks to different countries in the world for former smokers based off of what we're estimating is their um, smoking history. And so the places where we have a sense that people are smoking a high number of cigarettes per day, those countries are going to have higher relative risk compared to places with lots of occasional smokers or people smoking only one or two cigarettes a day.
Now, the last method slide is this uh, equation, which I'm not going to go into. Um, but this is how we pull together everything that I've talked about in producing a population attributable fraction. And a population attributable fraction is just the percent of all deaths or dallies that are um, attributable to a risk factor. So um, for smoking and lung cancer, it should be maybe about 80 percent. Um, for smoking and ischemic heart disease, it comes out to about 15 percent. Um, but there is integration and various prevalence estimates, which we can talk through later. Um, but the main building blocks that I've talked you through are these exposure estimates of current and former prevalence, um, individual distributions of exposure among those populations, as well as our generalizable dose response relative risks. Everyone doing OK? <laughs> um, any questions before I dive into results? OK. So the key takeaways from what we published in GBD 2017 are there are 1.2 billion current smokers in the world. And notably, two out of every three smokers live in the Asia Pacific region. So high population and high smoking prevalence. And so tobacco control efforts, of course, this is a way to um, target our limited resources. In terms of attributable burden, um, as Ryan mentioned, we estimate using this entirely new methodological framework, there are 7.1 million global deaths um, and about a million deaths attributable to secondhand smoke and smokeless tobacco. I think something um, that gives me confidence in our new approach, um, as well as confidence in our old approach, is that these numbers didn't change all that much. We used entirely new methods um, to get around some limitations, but we end up with roughly the same estimates. 78% of the deaths occur in lower and middle income countries, and that percentage is increasing over time and will continue to increase in the future. And smoking as a global risk factor remains um, top five, and um, it's actually a second ranked risk factor, and it's the first, um, it's the leading risk factor for men. I think really striking figure is that one in five male deaths is attributable to smoking, and 5% of female deaths. Now, if you look country by country in terms of this population attributable fraction number, so the way that you interpret this map is the very red countries have um, more than one in four, all the way up to almost one in three percent, uh, one in three deaths are attributable to smoking among men. And China tops the charts in this case. Among women, it's really offset by Greenland, which small population, very uh, heavy smoking burden. But here you can see the, the geographic pattern is really skewed towards high income countries where the smoking epidemic in lower and middle income countries among women, prevalence is still really quite low. Um, but in some places where it is increasing, such as Russia, the time lag between exposure and burden means that we are going to expect burden in these countries will be increasing among women in the future. But it's not something that we see right now. So these are actually some of my favorite charts. Um, and these are birth cohort. Um, prevalence estimates for a couple of, I think, indicator countries. And uh, the way you interpret these charts is the colors are birth cohorts, which you can follow back in time um, as they age. And I think what's, what's notable is this is a story of tobacco control or lack thereof, where you see in Brazil, um, you see that the smoking prevalence has come down a lot over time. The age at which people start to quit has gotten younger. And the peak prevalence among youth is getting lower and lower. And so the places where there's this big uh, gap in, in terms of the colors, that's where tobacco control has been really effective. Now, if you look at Indonesia and China, you'll see that there hasn't really been much progress over time in terms of controlling the tobacco epidemic. 
And the United States is one where we just didn't really follow it far enough back in time to capture the peak and the reduction like you're seeing in Brazil. And sorry, this is, this is mislabeled, but this is birth cohort prevalence among women. You can see that it's much, much lower, um, but there's some interesting patterns. You still see tobacco control being effective in Brazil and China, but you also see this pattern of increasing prevalence with age in China, India, Indonesia. And so this is a really interesting research question. I'm curious about, I've talked with some of you about this, whether it's people are, um, they're starting to smoke later on in life in these countries, or maybe self-report bias just isn't as um, strong. And so we see there is higher self-reported smoking prevalence, but maybe it's that younger people in these countries are just not telling us on surveys that they're smokers. We also have um, other indicators that I think are quite interesting to track, including tobacco consumption per capita between 1970 and 2019, so almost 50 years of progress um, in many parts of the world. But in the next slide, you'll see there's some um, really important countries where we have um, a lack of progress. And so in the United States, back in 1970, there was more than 4,000 um, cigarettes consumed per person. So this is sort of an average um, impact of tobacco on a population. So it's really high, but has gotten, um, gotten really low. But in the, the red and the yellow uh, countries in this figure, this is showing the places where tobacco consumption has increased over the last 50 years. And so this makes me really worried about places like Russia, places like China, where we have big countries where the tobacco consumption is increasing and we have a real lack of progress in terms of tobacco control. We also are able to estimate indicators like the age at which people start smoking. And a full distribution allows us to estimate the age by which a majority of people have started smoking in any given country. Um, we can also estimate 90%, 10% to characterize the transition over which people mainly go from potentially experimental smoking to becoming regular smokers. And here you can see that in all countries of the world, a majority of smokers begin smoking regularly before they turn 21. And it's much, much younger in many countries. And so I think this, you know, when people hear that uh, tobacco control, uh, tobacco industry is not targeting youth, of course, this figure is contradicts that, right? We're seeing that everyone that starts smoking, they start in their youth, and this is the age group that we really need to focus on in terms of tobacco control efforts. Now, the, the last few slides um, are thinking about the future. So we've produced a preliminary set of forecasts of smoking burden out through 2040. And the way that you interpret um, these charts is you see all of the different risk factors. There's 84 total, but here you just see the top ones and the percent of total deaths. And there is this horizontal bar, which is going to show you um, the reference case. So if everything stays the same, and then a better and a worse case. So if tobacco control is accelerated or if tobacco control is decelerated, what could happen if we look out in terms of deaths in 2040? So smoking will drop in rank Mainly not because the, the burden changes all that much, but because we have these metabolic risks that are shooting up, like the risk of high BMI. The reference scenario says that in 2040, 9.1% of deaths will be attributable to smoking, and that will translate into 6.8 million people. Now, if tobacco, can, so this worst scenario, right now it's just, we look at the annualized rate of change and we take the 15th percentile. So if we were to apply the 15th percentile in terms of annualized rate of change to all countries, this is what the state of the world could look like in 2040, where we have almost 14% of deaths attributable to smoking and 13.2 million people dying every year.
But this better scenario, and I think this is the one that's most interesting, is if the countries that right now are sort of stagnated in terms of tobacco control, if we could accelerate their progress to match the countries that are performing best, so the 85th percentile in terms of annualized rate of decline, then we could end up with only 6% of deaths attributable to smoking, and 3.7 million would be that number. So I think this is, sorry, if you look at smoking, we have the widest range of any of these risk factors in terms of possible future scenarios. So there's great opportunities for tobacco control, but if progress is not sustained, there's also really great risks. And to wrap up this, uh, this talk, um, there's lots and lots of applications. So our main focus is methodologically producing these estimates every year, but there are tons of applications um, that I really hope that some of you um, think about taking up, where you can use the global burden of disease estimates to do policy evaluations. Um, so you can say, what was the impact of raising taxes on smoking prevalence, on smoking deaths? Um, translate those into future policy scenarios, so not just doing this 15th and 85th percentile, but thinking about what would burden look like 40 years from now if taxes were raised to the level that is um, suggested in Empower. It also can allow us to target interventions, so thinking about the age groups at which people are most vulnerable for initiation, thinking about the, the gender differences and how we can target tobacco control by sex in different countries. Of course, it's important for health system planning, um, thinking about countries that are um, transitioning mainly from communicable to non-communicable diseases, thinking about how they should be planning their health system to account for the impacts of smoking in the future. And then finally, some of this work can be used to drive clinical screening, and that's mainly thinking about these relative risk estimates, which are pretty well described for things like lung cancer, but are not very well described for uh, fractures or for um, Parkinson's, um, where we have this decrease in risk. So we can think about um, clinical applications of some of the data and the methods work that we've done. And in terms of um, priorities in terms of methods development moving forward. The, the big question that we get asked every year is when are e-cigarettes e going to be included? Um, right now, it's, it's truly there's a lack of data, right? So we need to know what's the risk um, of non-smokers starting to use e-cigarettes and then transitioning to combustible products to capture increased health effects. We need to know the relative increase in quitting that might happen as a result of these products, so that harm reduction framework. And we also need to quantify the independent health effects, um, so the risks of using e-cigarettes and other novel products on their own. And then not only that, but if we wanted to do this in the global burden of disease framework, we need estimates of e-cigarette use for all the countries in the world. And none of this is available. So as much as I'd love to do this in the future, I think the first step for us is developing the modeling framework. And then we can plug in these parameters as they become available. Now, everything I've shown is based off of self-reported data. And this is um, potentially a significant limitation in many parts of the world, um, especially among women, potentially Africa and Asia, where there is um, socio-cultural acceptability components to be thinking about. And so being able to adjust for self-report bias, so when we have more biomarker data available, that will be um, really beneficial to improving these estimates. And then finally, as, as we mentioned earlier, um, this issue of adjusting for um, product toxicity is a key priority priority, as well as um, thinking about producing product-specific burden. So not saying what's the burden due to all smoked tobacco, but thinking about what's the burden due to cigarettes versus water pipe versus other products that people might be interested in. And finally, um, this is the portal at which you can access um, all of the data, the results, the code, um, and always feel free to email me. Um, I would love to get in touch, to chat. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. And yeah, really looking forward to questions and answers. <laughs>
explaining each step and why you've been taking us through that process, and then of course the data, um, the results are just overwhelming. So thank you. Um, we have a few minutes for questions. Yeah, Marisa, great work. Good job. Um, my question relates to uh, you talked uh, your last slide talked about applicability, and one of the one one of the, uh, the applications which I was at the, I was thinking is um, this this disease burden is focused on cigarettes, and you mentioned about countries transitioning from um, infectious diseases to non-infectious diseases. Can your models be applied to infectious diseases such as cholera, um, Ebola, and yeah, is, is that possible? Yeah, so um, I think so. One clarification, I, I think it's very confusing because a lot of my figures are labeled as cigarettes, but the, the burden estimates do incorporate all smoked tobacco products. It's just they get transformed into cigarette equivalents because that's mainly where the risk data lie. But in terms of applying these methods to other risk factors as well as diseases, um, absolutely. So I work on um, smoking and other, uh, another couple of risk factors. But there's a large team at IHME that is applying these methods and this, this uh, framework of thinking to not just 84 different risk factors, but more than 200 diseases, including cholera, di diarrhea, all the different um, health outcomes that you can think of. And the, the specific methods might vary, but the underlying principles are always the same. So we identify all available data. So this is really important because we don't want to just take a single government official data source, for example, because we don't know what biases there might be. So we always start with the comprehensive universe of data. We adjust it to make it comparable. And then we use a modeling framework that incorporates and reflects uncertainty to fill in data gaps. And so if you go, um, if you go to this website, you can not only just access the smoking results, but you can access estimates of the number of deaths due to cholera for every country, year, age, and sex. Um, and you can just download them as well as the data sources that were used to inform them. Fantastic resource. Um, maybe let me just ask a question while we're waiting for others. Um, so I think some of my colleagues have been involved in maybe those future projections of how to take into account um, interventions to reduce smoking, like smoke-free public places and those sorts of things. Can you talk a little bit more about how you incorporate all of that into the work that you do? So uh, specifics, not yet, because this is the main priority for our research team over the next year and a half. Um, but what we've started by doing is we want to estimate the effect sizes of these interventions. And that's actually a really challenging task. Um, when you think about trying to estimate a generalizable effect size, or even better, a country-specific effect size, but for all countries, um, what we do is we look at the, the time series, and then we employ some uh, mo like econometrics types uh, statistical analysis to estimate what's the effect of um, raising taxes on a change in prevalence. Um, some of the like limitations right now is thinking about whether the policies are additive or synergistic, um, but that's the really hard part in my mind is coming up with um, reliable estimates of the effects of policies. And then what we would do is we would um, apply those effects potentially in 2020. So we would say, okay, what would happen if a country passed a law to raise taxes in 2020? We could forecast out prevalence and the complication, like the complication would be also the effects on the amount that people are smoking. And then apply all of these same equations and relative risk models to come up with uh, scenario-based burden estimates. Where we're not just saying what, let's take the best rate of change and the worst rate of change observed, but saying, okay, what's an actual intervention that we might apply and what would be the health benefits 
um, that a country could expect to observe. And I think that, you know, that's one of the most compelling um, applications of this work, because as Ryan mentioned, um, if you can hand a policymaker um, the fact that you're going to save 10 million lives over the course of the next 100 years by raising taxes or by implementing public smoking bans, um, I think that is a really compelling and persuasive argument. As we get to Brian's question, as I walk over, um, so have your colleagues at IHME done this sort of thing in other for other risk factors or diseases in terms of those projections? So uh, let's see. We have done some smaller scale um, impact evaluations, looking at the impacts of um, specifically like malaria um, interventions, whether it. It being applied to um, especially like behavioral risk factors, um, tobacco is kind of paving that ground. But the idea is that we develop a modeling framework that can be applied not just to uh, smoking, but to all sorts of other risk factors that we want to be able to intervene on. I think that's going to be uh, the most powerful application of the GBD. So thinking not just what can we do around smoking, but can we also apply the same line of thinking to obesity, to alcohol, to all sorts of the different interventions and risks that we model? Um, great presentation. I guess I'm curious about, um, and it's going to be kind of a little bit of a wandering around question a little bit. What can we do with the GBD code? Can we replicate what you've done? And can we tinker around and run different models where maybe we make assumptions about a tobacco tax in the US will reduce uh, initiation by this much and increase cessation by this much and see what those results would be like? So at the scale of um, the GBD, you would need a computing cluster to be able to um, fully replicate what we're doing because it takes a lot of um, computation hours to do this type of work for every location, year, age, sex. But if you're interested in a specific country, um, that type of work potentially in a little bit more simplified format. So you don't need to do all of these like, ensemble type, now, like there's some simplifications that you could make where you could ask these very pertinent questions using um, the GBD data and code. Um, depending on your background, I think it might be something you could pick up out of the box. Um, all, our, all of our code is written in R, so I'm not sure if that is applicable, um, but what we'd be more than happy to do is um, get in touch with you, talk about how you would go about doing this, potentially um, help with some of the more computationally intensive steps, um, because really the questions that you're interested in answering are the same questions that we're interested in answering. We have shared goals. And so we do want to make um, our data useful um, to the extent that it's possible. Very quickly, because okay. we just have 30 seconds. Okay. Very quickly, so going back to what we were talking about, effect size. So I know the goal is to show that if the government passes a specific policy, then you would reduce you know, smoking or whatnot um, by a certain percentage. So I know you guys are not there yet, but I'm just wondering if you're also thinking about um, implementation, because that's kind of saying, I know it's really difficult, but that's kind of saying like, oh, if you pass this policy, this will happen, but that's not necessarily true because of um, all the difficulties with implementing and the differences in different countries. So just wondering if you guys have been thinking about that. We absolutely are thinking about that every day. Um, unfortunately, in terms of addressing that, we're, we don't have the data yet. Um, what we want would be data on um, compliance, data on enforcement, and it's really, really hard to get that type of information, especially across countries around the world. And so I think looking to some of the great work um, that's being you know, done at different research centers on specific countries, specific policies, we can learn some of those lessons and maybe toggle different assumptions based off of compliance and enforcement, but that is uh, a few iterations down the line, yeah. So unfortunately, we're out of time. Marissa can be here for a few more minutes if folks have other questions that weren't able to be answered. But please join me in thanking her for a fantastic talk today.